So as Monica introduced my talk, um, I'm going to talk about today uh, the special extent of contamination. Um, but first I want to start thanking our large group of collaborators. This is a group effort um, from uh, different institutions, students and technicians, and as well um, the funding um, from Gulf of Research Initiative through the two consortia, C-Image and DPAM. So you have seen this uh, diagram on the left before. It summarizes the different mechanisms for oil deposition in sediments in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. So you heard several talks about a specific of these mechanisms and their importance in moving oil in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. So today what I want to do, I want to focus on the transfer mechanism in general, trying to understand three very important questions. Where did the oil go? The extent of biological exposure to this oil when it was transported one, from one part of the Gulf to the other one? And where did it actually sink in the Gulf? So our field service, and you have seen um, some of these maps before, was focused on trying to sample as much as possible. So we had a high spatial coverage and a time series of fish communities and sediments on, from the Gulf of Mexico. So the left side map is showing the sites that we have on the continental shelf looking at fish uh, reef communities. And the red side on south of the left map is showing that we're a collection of deep mesopelagic fish communities. On the right side, you have seen already this map, it's showing our core insights in the Gulf of Mexico since 2010. So um, we took the decision that if we really want to understand the potential impacts of the Dewar horizon on the pelagic communities, we needed to have very two different distinct fish communities. So on the left side is the shallow water communities, which are characterized by uh, fish species living between 20 to 100 meters. They are small, in, they are big in size, they are commercially important species, for example, red snapper. They have limited migration and their diet is linked to the benthic environment, at least most of them. In contrast, the deep water communities, they are, live between 200 and 1,000 meters depth. They are more, more small in size. They are not commercially important, although they are very important for a lot of other animals um, in the Gulf, so they are the food for older animals. They have a large style of vertical migration, which means they swim every night to the surface to eat, so they uh, have um, a lot of contact with the water column and what is going on in the water column, and also their diet is linked to the water column um, in zooplankton. So uh, initial studies shows that there were indicators that these communities were impacted. So um, stable isotopes analysis showed that the, there was a change in tropic ecology. So um, these fish communities, both fish communities, which are not directly linked, they show that they changed in their diet. Also, there was a change in community structure, especially in the shallow water fish communities. And there was an increase in number of skin lesions on, especially on, um, on the continental slope uh, fish communities, indicating that probably their health was uh, affected after the oil spill. But the tricky point here, the challenge for us, was how to link these initial studies uh, potential impact to the communities to actually the environmental um, impact that we were able to see or the concentration of contaminants. So to do this, what we did, we have a time series uh, studies on the shallow water and the deep water communities. So on the left side, it's a graph showing the concentrations of pHs we are, these um, molecules that are found in the oil and as well in the, in the environment but they have a very distinct composition in the oil versus what you see in the environment. Also, these compounds are very toxic. So we look at the composition of these uh, toxic compounds in liver and muscle tissues of the shallow waters and the uh, deep water communities, and what it shows that both communities are not directly related, they show a, a very similar pattern. They both have higher concentrations um, late in 2010 and in 2011, and that those concentrations drop after that. So both communities show an episodic exposure to elevated pHs um, that indicated that they were contaminated for about two years. Uh, they are still undergoing uh, studies to look at the long-term effects on these communities. 
So when we look at specifics of the composition of the oil and how changes in time, we were able to see there was a large partial and temporal extent of exposure to the oil. Um, and this was not only one mechanism that was moving the oil in one part of the Gulf to the other one, it was actually a combination of different mechanisms. So for example, on the continental shelf, uh, the surface lake was moved uh, towards that and the weather oil actually sink it was uh, um, affected probably the diet and um, the food resources for this community. Um, for the deeper sites, for the mesopelagic fish communities, uh, they may probably be affected not only by the surface oil slick, but also by the deep plume. And on the bottom I'm showing a map uh, that was published in 2012 showing simulations of the distribution of the deep plume in red, which indicates that the deep plume probably didn't only went southwest of the deep water horizon, but also to the east. So it may have affected uh, more uh, these pelagic communities than we saw before. So now moving on to the sediment environment. Uh, you have seen this uh, map before. And what we did, um, we uh, focused our initial studies to the DeSoto Canyon as Dave and Greg Brooks uh, spoke before. And we used this uh, because we integrated the geochronology with the organic geochemistry in order to understand where actually the oil uh, sinks to the bottom of this region of the Gulf. So you have seen this graph before where we have a sediment core where we uh, have the chronology and we analyze the chemicals at each of these layers. And what we found, if you look at the gray area on these graphs, is the hydrocarbons, uh, looking at total aliphatics and low molecular weight pHs. They were higher in concentration um, during 2010 and 2011 relative to background levels. And when we compare this to benthic organisms, uh, the numbers of forms, at that same range of time, they decrease in their density. Some of the sites should recover after this time and some of other sites, they're still um, showing no recovery. Uh, also, when we look at specifically at the composition of these hydrocarbons, we were able as well as we were able to see in these uh, other two very distinct fish communities that different mechanisms were uh, responsible for bringing this oil to the bottom of, of the Gulf. And so there are geochemical evidence of hydrocarbons inputs via the marine snow or mosfa, as Dave explained, and the deep plume. But even though we have all these sample sites and we look at uh, different communities and sediment cores over time, we uh, thought that this special recovery was not enough if we want to determine or have a better view of where the oil go in after 2010 and how much actually sank into the bottom of the Gulf. So what we did, we took our uh, sites and we integrated our database with Irma NOAA BP databases. And you can see here is a map of our new study area, which is larger, and we have a larger number of sites. And we divided the area in the coastal area that goes up to 50 kilometers offshore, um, the continental shelf that goes from 50 kilometers offshore to the slope break, and then the deep sea area and we look at the composition of the hydrocarbons that we'll see in the surface of the sediments. But again, we want to resolve how much actually reached the bottom of the sediments relative to baseline or background data. So we use our initial uh, studies that indicates that there was um, a, one layer, a one centimeter layer on the surface that has the composition um, similar to deep water horizon oil or conditions that indicated that event or multiple event happened uh, recently. So we compare those concentrations on the surface and, and compare it to the background levels uh, to determine a number which we call the excess deposition of hydrocarbons post spill, which is basically the excess that was deposited after 2010. And we thought about this uh, way of approach this question because the deep water horizon spill, um, spill um, hydrocarbons over seven times the average annual input of that we see in the Gulf of Mexico. So you will expect if for a large amount of input of hydrocarbons in a short period of time, you should be able to see it on the surface of the sediments if actually that happened. So if we look at only at the sites that show contamination, in other words, it has the excess of hydrocarbons, so there was a large uh, spatial extent in each of these um, areas in the Gulf. So on the top is, in green, is the coastal area and shows that 57% of the sites that 
we um, have access to show contamination up to a distance of 100 kilometers away from the Deep Water Horizon site. The continental shelf, uh, we have lower number of sites, but um, again, for, there was a large number, or at least almost 50% of the sites have contamination, and we saw this contamination up to 500 kilometers away from the Deep Water Horizon site. And the deep sea have a higher number of contaminated sites, 85% up to a distance of 180 kilometers away from the deep water horizon site. So we found that um, there was a larger extent of contamination in our study area that uh, we have seen uh, reported before, especially in the deep sea area. So now comparing each of the areas, uh, the surface layer, which is shown here on the bottom of the post field layer versus the pre spill layer, we see that the coastal area has a 34 increase in post field layer in concentrations of hydrocarbons compared to what you see in the pre spill layer. When we use the same approach and look at the continental shelf, there is a small, not significant increase. So there was actually not a significant um, deposition of hydrocarbons in this area. And this is in contrast with the deep sea, which have a uh, threefold increase after uh, the post spill. So when you look at uh, the whole uh, study area, the coastal continental shelf, you see, you can see by looking only the pre spill layer that the deeper areas are um, function as a repository for hydrocarbon. And so if you look at this bar here, it's in the press field layer in the deep sea, it's higher in concentration than in the other areas. And when you look at the post field layer, it indicates the continental shelf is a transition zone, so there is no deposition in there. So, oh, this is not good. <laughs> okay, this sounds better. <laughs> so again, um, now we want, um, to look at the quantification of large scale of contamination for spill, and we did a spatial interpolation analysis of the excess of hydrocarbon uh, to calculate the community area extent, or in other words, the contamination or the spatial extent of this. Um, so here is the map that I want to show. So we have all our area, we calculated the excess of deposition, um, and the colors indicate ranges of hydrocarbons. Uh, in excess in the, in the sediment. So in blue, our sites are non-contaminated post-spill, and the uh, yellow ones are the ones that are contaminated at low concentrations, and it goes up until the stronger red is the most contaminated sample post-spill. So we found that 56% of the study area was contaminated, and there were large areas um, in each of these areas here, and the coastal continental shell, the deep sea. Um, when we look at the distribution of this deposition of hydrocarbons post spill, we can, um, in compare with initial studies, uh, that there were different mechanisms that actually move oil into these areas. So, for example, if we look at uh, the left side of the map, uh, the winds actually, um, even though the, um, there was more uh, water flowing out of the Mississippi, the winds were able to actually pull um, hydrocarbons from the surface lake into the marshes area. When we look to the right side of the map, um, the winds were anticyclonic circulation is at the Mississippi Delta, created a front that restrained the transport of the oil onshore. So there were less contamination onshore, but also there was a large phytoplankton plant bloom in that area where um, other people were able to see muscle effect uh, or muscle processes in there. And in the deep sea area, uh, we saw uh, that the composition of the oil looks uh, more as the marine snow or actually sediment deposition, as Greg Brooks explained before. But then the question is how much was deposited? So now we have a larger extent of study sites. Uh, we um, have a approach to measure how much was deposited post spill and agrees with previous studies. So what we did was just uh, compare the area with the sediment mass and the average of hydrocarbon for each of the ranges and make a total calculation of how much was deposited and here are the numbers. And then what we did, we compared those numbers with the total discharge of hydrocarbon. So this is a pie that was published before in 2012 and it was showing where actually uh, the oil went in 2010. So you see it in all the different ranges in blue are recovery, evaporation, dissolved, natural and chemical dispersed. But there was also always a, a part of that pie that um, people were not able to constrain. And um, with our calculations, we were able to see that 2% of that um, 
oil was deposited in the deep sea, a uh, very tiny amount, uh, like 0.2, that is not significant in the continental shelf, and 22%, which is actually when you put the arrow bars in there, is from 17 to 30% uh, was deposited in the coastal areas. So just to summarize, uh, our time series of fish community indicates that there was an episodic exposure to toxic compounds, pHs, that suggested contamination post spill. Sediment studies indicate larger spatial extent of contamination post spill than was previously reported by other studies. Also, there was a significant deposition of oil on the bottom of the Gulf, uh, mostly was deposited in the coastal areas. And the continental shelf acts as a transitional zone in the Gulf. Also, a large-scale integration of hydrocarbons in contaminated areas indicates surface sediment layer contains about 70 to 30 percent of the released hydrocarbons in 2010. And that's it. And I think we're ready for questions. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat, please. We're going to open it up to 